Welcome to Authorhub Stories. This is a new feature we're really excited about. And today we'll be discussing the story of Mr. David Selu. It's a story that sent shockwaves throughout the world of medicine and has implications for every doctor. This is a story that will cover a stellar career, medical error and blame culture, injustice, and a fight to make sure this doesn't happen again. David Selu is a respected colorectal surgeon with over 40 years of outstanding medical service and he's saved countless lives over four decades of practice. However, one patient encounter uh, changed his life forever when a patient died under his care in 2010. He was investigated by the GMC and tried at the Old Bailey where he was charged and convicted of uh, gross negligence manslaughter in 2013. Many of the complexities of the case were not adequately explained by the judge to the jury and he was convicted by the jury with a majority of 10 to 2. He was jailed in a maximum security prison and served 15 months of a two and a half year sentence. His conviction was later quashed on appeal after major failings were discovered during the handling of his first trial. Mr. Selu, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Cash. It's a huge pleasure and it's a privilege for me to be on this program. Well, thank you, sir. It's an honor to see you again. Um, let's start. Um, the, the, the case that we refer to has defined um, rightly or wrongly, your practice, your career. What I'd like to do is to get the whole, your story and your journey. So you were born in Sierra Leone. Yes, the I was. And you were the eldest of 10 children. Yes. But we don't quite know when you were born. No, I don't. Um, the reason for that was that records were not kept in my village and my parents were illiterate. So how was your date of birth allocated in the end? Well, it's a bit of a long story. I wasn't really destined to go to school. My parents were subsistence farmers, and that's what my life was uh, cut out to be. However, by a quirk of fate, my aunt came over. She didn't have children, took me away to the city called Bo, and that's where I was, helping her carry out her trade. She was a seamstress. And I used to go around with her, collecting money from her customers. When I was at her place, I found myself a group of children who I found fascinating. They were from what one might describe as a middle-class Sierra Leonean family. They went to school. Their parents, their parents were teachers. And they had a local football team on which I was recruited. And I was the goalkeeper, so right. they, they obviously found me a very great asset on the team. So good with your hands. Yes, indeed. Mm. And in exchange for my goalkeeping, I said, could you teach me to read and write? I quite like the fact that you can look at a piece of paper and say things out of it, and it fascinated me. So they taught me how to read and write. Uh, and as well before I even went to school. It was really on account of the fact that I was able to read and write, that one day somebody came to our house, put a newspaper down, and I picked it up and I started reading. And he was just fascinated by the fact that I'd never been to school. And here I was, I, I was reading a newspaper. Of course, I was reading words. I didn't really understand what I was reading. But um, he said to my aunt, I think you've got to send this boy to school. So the thing that, that, that's fascinating, I was reading your book, David Selu, Did He Save Lives? A Surgeon's Story. And it was fascinating because it really was quite a, a, a challenging upbringing. You, you said you're the eldest of 10 children. You didn't, have, didn't wear shoes till you were a teenager. You essentially taught yourself to read and write. And you were often studying under street lamps because um, electricity was scarce. What are your memories of childhood? Childhood was a happy uh, childhood. My uncle, had fought in the Second World War. He fought with the Allies in Burma. Uh, Burma, as you'll remember, was the point at which the Japanese wanted to take India and also to infiltrate into uh, China. So it was a major point of battle for the Allies. It would have made a huge amount of difference had the Japanese actually taken India. So the um, Allies recruited from various parts of the Commonwealth, including Sierra Leone. And my uncle joined, uh, and he told really fascinating stories about his time in the Second World War. And he gave a very happy home environment. Obviously, it wasn't a rich environment, because there were quite a lot of things we used to do, you know, bring firewood home and etc. 
fetch water and clean the house, etc. But he provided a reasonably comfortable house for us, and we had, you know, about enough food to eat and so on. But he did provide the environment when I did get to school eventually for me to uh, get education. It wasn't easy, but as you say, uh, electricity was in short supply. And so, you know, one way I could do my studies was to sit on the street light. And uh, that was tough, but I, I, I persevered. Well, you did more than persevere. You, you, I would say that you excelled. You, were the, you then uh, were awarded a scholarship to study medicine at Manchester. What year was that? We had to do uh, A-levels and O-levels equivalent to what was done in the UK because the exam papers were marked by a Cambridge uh, external examining body. And on the basis of my A-level results, I got a place in Manchester. And also on the basis of that, I was awarded a national scholarship. I'd never have been able to afford to come to England uh, because we just didn't have the money. But that scholarship gave me the privilege to come to medical school. So when you came to Manchester, was that the first time that you'd left uh, Sierra Leone? I'd been to Liberia which is the neighboring country back there. We used to simply just walk across the border. All oh, right. That's, but yeah. uh, my proper official visit out of the country on a passport on, yeah. uh, on a plane. was actually when I came to the uh, United Kingdom. And um, I must say that um, as a Liverpool fan, I was really disappointed to hear that you're, that you're a Man United fan. Sadly, I am, <laughs> yes. Still, <laughs> st still am, still Stop am. Stop it here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you saw D George Best play. I, I, that, that was the highlight of my career. That yeah. was probably uh, one of the best moments, apart from seeing snow for the first time. Yeah. It's one of the uh, career, my life-defining moments, watching George Best play uh, football for Manchester well, United. I guess I can't begrudge you that. And then after your training, uh, you undertook surgical training locally, and you progressed to become a senior lecturer in surgery at Hammersmith Hospital. Yes, it, there was a bit of a story before that. Um, I was doing a senior registrar job in Birmingham and as you can imagine jobs in general surgery especially for you know people of color was was very difficult I'd been applying for jobs and the professor I was working for in what was then Dudley Road Hospital in Bir Birmingham came to me one day uh, in between patients and he said oh by the way a colleague of mine Douglas Roy has just been appointed professor of surgery in a hospital, a brand new tertiary hospital in a place called Oman in the right. Middle East. Okay. And he's looking for consultants. And I think you will admirably fit in as a consultant in this establishment. And incidentally, they also uh, built a medical school, which is going to be working in tandem with this tertiary hospital. And so you'll also be uh, employed in uh, you know, as a foundational medical school training uh, young medical uh, students. And I came back to my wife that evening and we said, well, where is Oman? We'd never actually heard of the place. And this was before the days of the internet. So I went to the library the next day, found out where Oman was. And um, we said, well, you know, give it a go. We'd quite like to go. We were given the option of actually going to see the place before we took the job but at our expense, but we decided we'll, 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 we'll go anyway. I went for the interviews uh, some months later. I was offered the job and I went as a, a senior lecturer and as a consultant surgeon right. in the um, hospital in Oman in the Middle East. So that's where my first consultancy actually right. started. I was, we were there, there for was it five, in a year, five, five years or so? Five years, five and a half years. Right. In fact, it was really a place we could have stayed forever. The only reason we came back to England was because our eldest daughter had reached the top of the educational system there and the choice was either to send her to boarding school in England or, or come back together. And I was fortunate to get a job at Hammersmith Hospital as a senior lecturer in surgery at just about that right time. So we all came back to uh, England and relocated back here. So that's really how uh, my first job started in, in the UK. Fantastic. So that was 
what was the Royal Postgraduate Medical School? Uh, it was then the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, but in 2000, it was subsumed into Imperial College. And then at that time, I decided to take on a purely, initially the job was uh, affiliated with a consultant job at Ealing Hospital. So I was commuting between the two hospitals. I'd spent uh, two days at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School and three days at Ealing. And I decided to relocate entirely to Ealing Hospital and purely as an NHS consultant colorectal surgeon. And that was in the year 2000. Right, because I was, so I was, I had the privilege of being your SHO in 2004. Um, you won't remember me, I didn't make much of a mark, I'm sure. Oh, you, but, did. you did, you did, Cash, you did. <laughs> You're too kind. I'm going to have to pay, I'll, I'll pay you later. Um, what I remember so well from that time was a patient carrying an empathic doctor, a family man, a gentleman, a gentleman. You. you were a gentleman. Thank you. And you're a very patient teacher Thank because you. you taught me how to do sigmoidoscopes and how to do injections of phenol and banding. Um, and I also well, it didn't obviously work very well because you went on to be an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. I hope you found yeah. the use of the uh, sigmoidoscope in uh, orthopedic surgery. I'd never <laughs> quite worked that one out. But uh, Well, in one of the podcasts Pete Bates and I did, he, he, he had an open pelvic fracture and he's asked me if I could arthroscope a rectum. <laughs> so the skills are transferable. So, yeah, okay. It, okay. Exists, it did yeah. come in handy at some point. The other thing was I often saw you in the hospital on Sunday afternoons doing admin when I was on call. I remember being in the office and you coming in I may be surprised seeing you, A, not in a suit and tie, and then you doing your admin on a Sunday. And I, I must say that uh, that work ethic really struck me at that time. I'd not seen that before. Well, it was a great time to do ward rounds and to do administration that had been neglected during the whole week without bleeps and phones going. So I found that a calming time as well. But yes, it's quite hard coming in to do uh, ward rounds and administrative work that weekends. But that's how life was. And, and that's the side of the consultant life that a lot of people don't see or appreciate. True, true. And your book is entitled, Did He Save Lives? Yeah. And I've saw, I saw you firsthand save lives. I remember a post at Water End where you picked up an incarcerated femoral hernia that had been missed in an obstructed patient, took him to theatre, saved it in time. I saw it countless times. Yes, I remember the episode well, actually. Oh, you good, do? My good memory. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. I, mm. I've, no, I've, I've fond memories. I told you it really made a mark. That was why I was... We were so keen to have you as our first ever guest on uh, the Author Hub Stories. And then 2010, you know, it all comes to a sudden stop. Yes. You know, I don't particularly want to get into the specifics of the case because I think the details are widely available and people can go through there. But suffice to say that there were multiple systemic issues. Um, just before we start of discussing this, I want to say, as you said in your book, and as I've seen you state every time I've, I've heard you talk about this, that you've expressed sympathy to the patient and their family for their loss. Yes. And, that's the first thing that you always refer to. Yes. It's a sad story. The patient was a 66-year-old man. He'd had a total knee replacement five days before. And I saw him, I was asked to see him because he'd, as you say, developed abdominal pain. What I didn't know at the time was that he had spontaneously perforated his large bowel. And the points to make about that are several. One uh, perforation of a sigmoid colon is a life-threatening con condition. One in three patients who get it die from it, however well they're treated. There were multiple systemic problems. There were no uh, anesthetists available in this particular private hospital. And I have to emphasize this all happened in a private hospital, not an NHS hospital. Uh, because I think it's important to make that distinction. The hospital did not have any dedicated theatres for uh, emergency operations, even though they were uh, carrying out very complex operations. And I, I've, yeah, and I often wondered what would happen if somebody suddenly bled in the middle of the night and had to, or e even in the daytime, had to have an operation and all theatres were occupied. The patient had a number of comorbidities. We discovered he had cirrhosis of his liver, which hadn't been diagnosed before the operation. He was also obese. He had a BMI of about 31, 32. So uh, there were a number of issues, the lack of anesthetists, the lack of an operating theater, an RMO who didn't really speak much English, who was looking after almost 100 patients in this hospital, 
and who had been sleeping in the hospital seven days on the trot, uh, going from one patient to the next. So the conditions in the hospital were not ideal. The patient died. The patient rather had abdominal pain. I ultimately diagnosed he had uh, perforated diverticular disease. And I wanted to operate, but not having an anesthetist, I had to go on to find an anesthetist on a Friday afternoon. It wasn't an easy business. Uh, we were phoning around for nearly a couple of hours before we ultimately found someone who could operate, but again, operate only on condition that it was at a certain time of evening, and I had no choice. Anyway, ultimately, I did the operation, but... How long did it take, the operation? It took me the best part of about five hours. And my understanding from reading the, the, the case notes was that the operation was performed meticulously. Yes, nobody, none of the um, expert witnesses really had any qualms about the way that I performed the operation. I think they were, they were all uh, in agreement that my technical ability uh, was faultless. But this, sadly, as you say, the patient died and I've always expressed my sorrow to his family because he died on, on my watch. And it's a burden that, that you as a, as a surgeon, as a consultant, have to, to carry. Every, every doctor, I'd say, carries that burden because we practice an imperfect uh, discipline. I think in spite of what people would like you to believe, medicine is really not, not perfection. Uh, it does have flaws. What we do is we try and utilize the good bits of medicine and uh, try and minimize the, the flaws that medicine comes with. This is really the art of uh, medical practice. And when it comes to medical errors, people often talk about the Swiss, Swiss cheese effect where you've got these little holes in the cheese running through. And it really is that in, your, in this particular case, all those holes lined up. Yes, there are experts now who don't really believe in the term medical error. That any error in any setting and particularly in medicine. Medicine, remember, is one of the most complex of human endeavors. It involves medicine, it involves science, it involves art, it involves psychology, it involves empathy, and there's a whole load of skills that come into delivering medical or health care. And this doesn't just go for doctors, it goes for the whole spectrum of people uh, practicing uh, health delivery, that the word medical error is really a misnomer because it pins a blame on an individual when you talk about medical error, that in fact uh, it's really all a systemic problem, that any error that occurs in a medical environment is really a systemic setting, rather the Swiss cheese effect that you mentioned. Yeah and that it's occurred because there is a fault in the system or there are a series of faults that have lined up yeah. to produce that effect rather than the actions of one individual. There was a negative report from the hospital. You were reported to the GMC and their initial conclusion was that there was no case to answer but they reserved the right to reopen the case if, if it felt appropriate after a coroner's case. Yes, Kash, if I can just take you back slightly to the hospital itself. When a serious incident occurs in the hospital, the requirements are in law that you do two investigations. One, obviously, if there is somebody who is at the top end of the chain, you investigate the actions of that individual or groups of individuals, as the case may be. But what the law also requires is that you also look at systemic factors to see whether there were things in the system that might have contributed to that serious incident. And the idea is that you put together all of that in conjunction to come to a decision as to what had gone wrong. Now what happened in this particular private hospital was that they did the uh, investigation into me, they also did an investigation into systemic issues in the hospital. Yes, the expert witness who was appointed on this committee that investigated me wrote a very negative report about me. Incidentally, that expert witness uh, practiced in a hospital in Burton-on-Trent 
that had come out as the worst hospital in delivering cancer care for three consecutive years. One in six of their elective patients died uh, after... One in six. One in six at, after elective bowel cancer surgery. So the person who was appointed to actually scrutinize me himself had a lot of questions to answer, but park that to one side. But it, and that is the case of who watches the watchmen. Well, exactly, exactly. But uh, what the hospital did was they took one critical report of me. There was also a very critical report of hospital systems. That report was actually done by one of their own quality managers. And they, that report highlighted a number of issues, the lack of an anesthetic rotor, the lack of a dedicated theater, the fact that the nurses were actually lacking. They were, there were lots of observations they didn't do. They didn't know how to add up together the results of their observations that they were doing. There was a lack of ITU outreach, for example. There was an automatic mechanism whereby any seriously ill patient on the wards was automatically notified to the intensive care and they were meant to come and supervise the patient until the patient had the operation. What went forward mm. was the critical report into me and that was what was used throughout my yeah. uh, investigation initially to the GMC. And interestingly, the GMC actually did a very thorough investigation of uh, exactly what happened and they said there was no case to answer. Mm. But as you say, they reserved the right, uh, as they knew that there was going to be a coroner's inquest, that if any issues were raised, they would revive the whole issue and reinvestigate. And it was this coroner's report, that the coroner's case, that really changed things for you? Yes, it did. What the coroner did was he scheduled the investigation over about five days. And I was ro rostered to appear on day three. So I went in, having read a bit about the case, but knowing that once I'd begun to hear some of the evidence, I'd go back and do some further reading so that I'd be really fully prepared for when mm. I was on, on day three. I think it was probably on the basis of some negative reports that the coroner had already received from the hospital that he started the inquest and by the end of the first morning he got me on the witness stand and it was a very traumatic very aggressive questioning and you know fingers banging on the table voices raised and mm. from his whole body language I knew I was in for a difficult time and he didn't really allow me to say very much uh, asked lots and lots of questions I mean one of the questions he asked was really three questions in one and of which one was, when did you see the X-ray report? Mm. And I said, I saw the X-ray report at midday or at lunchtime. And I didn't actually look at the X-ray images until uh, an hour or so before I operated, which was much later. Mm. And that was conflated as me talking about seeing the X-ray images at lunchtime. No, I didn't see the X-ray images yeah. at lunchtime. I saw the X-ray report, which the radiologist had very comprehensively written, yeah. at lunchtime. And that was the basis of a perjury charge that I had lied under oath because I said I saw the X-ray report at lunchtime. Indeed, I'd seen the X-ray report at lunchtime, but I didn't see the X-ray images until much so, later. And as a result, things escalated quite quickly. So things es escalated. So what the coroner decided to do was to say he decided on the basis, again, as I say, of a negative report by the expert witness and his co-author who'd investigated me, that there was a case to answer, and he decided to terminate the inquest and to refer the case to the police. So that's, that's the point at which this, this becomes a criminal case? Well, it potential criminal case. Yeah. Remember, these are all allegations so Sorry, far. Yeah, the, the Nothing, rule of law. No, nothing's really been proved. Yeah. But of course, if you read the press, uh, I was already guilty even before I'd been charged of anything. Uh, if, you know, the, the, the press were really issuing some pretty negative reports even from that point on. But yes, from that point on, things really changed. The police were involved. So then the GMC suspended your registration at that point? Yes, uh, the GMC 
did open a second investigation shortly after that and said, well, uh, no, not, not immediately, not at that point. Okay. They said, we hear the case has now been reported to the police. Uh, nothing's happened yet, but we will now limit your practice purely to NHS. We'll stop you doing private practice. And so my, uh, and in any case, by this point, I'd been suspended from the private hospital. So my practice was now limited purely to NHS rather than private. So things began to really escalate from that point on. How long after the coroner's case was it that your GMC registration was suspended? It was probably about nine months later when it was fully suspended. That's the point at which uh, they decided to charge me for manslaughter and perjury. That's, that's after the police, full police investigation. And when uh, the GMC do that, then Ealing then um, made a decision to terminate your contract? Yes, it's really a bit of a technical point. And unfortunately, I thought I was going to get more support from the um, oh. NHS, even though I had not been charged of, I had not been found guilty of any offence. Mm. The fact that my name had now been suspended from the medical register albeit temporarily by the GMC, meant that the hospital could now say, well, you're no longer technically a doctor uh, because you're not on the register, and therefore we now have the right to suspend you from practice. So even the, the irony of all of this was I'd not been charged, I'd not been convicted of any, any wrongdoing, mm. and yet I'd lost my, I lost my, I lost my job and my, my earnings, my living, and yet you've still, you've got your wife, you've, I mean, she was working at the time, but you've got four children, you have I a mortgage. I four children, yeah. I had a child, I had a son in medical school, and no doubt we'll come to talk about him a little bit later on, because he's, he really struggled uh, to cope with my case. Yeah. You had three years between this unfortunate death and then the culmination of the court case. Yes. There was negative media throughout. What's it like hang, with this hanging over you? In those three years, and you have an operating list, you know, two years later, 2012, is it, is it there in the back of your mind? Absolutely, and this was really one of the most difficult times in life. Here I was now, potentially facing a criminal charge of a patient having died under my care, and I was still operating, giving life-saving care. And at that point, you're really walking on eggshells because you don't know now any simple mistake or judgment of error or alleged mistake or whatever was going to be suddenly escalated on top of everything that was mm. happening. But it wasn't just that. The press were now obviously on my case and you know they were knocking on my door at all sorts of hours asking questions and so on. So my family and I were very traumatized by all this event. And as you say, uh, it was very unfair. Justice delayed is justice denied. Absolutely. It was a good three years between when this patient died and when I was uh, ultimately tried. And so this whole time there is this cloud hanging over you, that even on a weekend you're going for a walk with your wife. The yes, fact is it's there. It uh, absolutely couldn't be for forgotten. And that really was something that I talked about at the end of my trial because uh, we had been so traumatized, the adrenaline by then had completely dried up. The whole time that this was going on, when it got to court, you were in the Old Bailey. Yes. In kind of the most high profile court in the land, in court number one. The fact is that the reason there was such media attention was because it was promoted as a high profile surgeon yes. doing something wrong. Yes, uh, I think the Crown Prosecution Service saw this as an opportunity to really make their mark. Number one, there had been some difficulty uh, prosecuting doctors, particularly people in healthcare. And they saw me as a soft touch. I was black and therefore easy to prosecute. It's a sad fact, unfortunately, even in a civilized country such as ours, that because you are a person of color, you are at that disadvantage. Uh, a jury finds it much easier to convict a black person than a white person. That's yeah. number one. Number two, of course, here was a surgeon uh, now being tried for killing one of his own patients. That 
generate a lot of, a lot of media interest. And as you say, the uh, case didn't actually happen in the jurisdiction of the Old Bailey. It happened in Harrow. And there is an adequate Crown Court in Harrow, but they decided to hold it in the Old Bailey. Not just in the Old Bailey, but in court number one in the Old Bailey, the most, the most famous courtroom in the whole world. I mean, that automatically makes it a show trial. It was, a, it was absolutely a show trial. And also, of course, they then compounded this with a charge of perjury. The problem with the perjury charge was, even though this was a purely spurious charge, is that perjury, interestingly, is actually much more serious than manslaughter. So if you were charged, if you were convicted of perjury and manslaughter, you'd probably get a, great, a more serious um, punishment for the perjury charge than, than, than the manslaughter charge. So perjury is a very serious crime in law. And compounding a manslaughter charge with a perjury charge just made it more difficult for me to defend myself. So they really went out of their way to make it their utmost to make sure they got a conviction. So there's almost like a two-pronged attack. There's the, was, if, you're, if, you perj if you're committing perjury, then clearly you're capable of these things. Yes. And yes. so it, so it compounds they, it. Everything was my, everything I said was scrutinized. Remember this whole case took over three years to happen. And every single thing that I did was forensically examined if there was ever any discrepancy in anything that you did. You did A before you did B in one statement, and you did B before you did A actually in real life. You know, this was three years later, and human memory being what it is, uh, that was taken as a lie. And, yeah. and well, you were nature. now being promoted as a liar yeah. in front of a jury. Which makes it almost, you more, seem more likely to commit these other acts. Absolutely, um, yeah. Which is astonishing, because I would, I would ask anyone watching this to re remember what they had for lunch you know, a week ago. Yes, yes. Um, it, it really is that. Did you, did you ever think, really in your heart and heart, did you ever think you'd be found guilty? Oh, I, yes, I did. For a number of, for the reasons that I've said, one, it's very easy to to convict uh, people of colour, and that's a sad, sad reflection on our justice system. Uh, the Crown Prosecution Service had not had a su successful case for some time, and they were looking for someone to make their mark. Why, why else hold it in the Old Bailey? So, so it, it didn't come as a complete surprise that I was found guilty in the end. The, without getting too much into the, into the technicalities, the jury said to the judge, we don't understand what we're being asked to do here. Yes, I think there were, there were a number of reasons for that. First of all, this was a complex medical case. Now remember, in, for example, in military uh, trials, what they do is to have real soldiers as jury. The reason is that they'd been there, they'd done that. Uh, so they understand, the they understand the problems of being on the front line. One of the things I found very unfair in my trial was that the, the, the judge was telling the jury, put yourself in Mr. Selly's position and imagine what he should have known or did know at the time that he did ABC. And I used to say to myself, well, how can a lay jury who have never made life and death decisions really know what I could have been going through and thinking at the time that I did. And the other thing that the prosecution did was they really oversimplified medical issues. I mean, it's fair to say that even the prosecution didn't really understand the complexities of medical, medical cases, but they tried to use emotion. Somebody died, somebody was in charge, Therefore, somebody was responsible. Somebody has to pay. And somebody had to pay. This is yeah. the kind of culture that we live in in this country. We are a country that believes in, in retribution, in revenge, and so on. Somebody died. We've got to exact revenge over this. But medical issues were oversimplified. I mean, let me give you an example. One of the things that I was meant to do was uh, once I had made the diagnosis that the patient had a perforated bowel. I was then meant to drop everything, go into theatre, knock on a theatre door, and say to a colleague who was doing an orthopaedic operation, mid-operation, mid -operation, can you get out, please, so that I can get in and put my patient on the table, the so-called breakthrough policy. 
Which, what, which is what a layperson would say, well, you need surgery, go do the surgery. The yes. fact is, well, there are myriad steps. When they, when they steps. watch this on Holby City, this is precisely what happens. In Holby City, you simply say, theatre, and suddenly the patient is lying on an operating theatre, all draped, ready for you to operate. But of course, in the real world, it just doesn't happen like that. Uh, you have to have your own team. Uh, oh, well, what you should have done was to say to the anaesthetist operating with the orthopedic surgeon, please, can you do my case next? And I said to them, well, there are a number of reasons why that anaesthetist would not do the operation. First of all, they have no obligation to do it in a private setting. They've commissioned uh, two hours to come and do this operation, and as soon as they finish, they had something else Another to do, and yeah. therefore they would go. Secondly, they may, they may be very good orthopedic anaesthetists, but they're not very good bowel anaesthetists, in the same way that I, I can't really do an, a, a knee replacement, uh, with all due respect. So uh, <laughs> we, can quickly t we can teach you. If you can teach me how to do some general surgery, yes, we could do that. Yeah, so, um, you know, there was really the lack of understanding of the jury in complex medical issues. I mean, another issue was, why didn't you just put him in an ambulance and send him to a hospital that could do the operation. So that, that is something that, that has come up. Yes. Now, the reason I didn't do it was because I'd been precisely in that position, but on the opposite side of the, the table. At Ealing Hospital, one year, not all that long before, I had a patient who I wanted to operate on with an emergency bowel problem. Mm. However, I did not have an intensive care bed in the hospital, and the anaesthetist there would not allow me to do the operation because there would be nowhere for him to be lodged. It wasn't an operation that had to be done immediately. It could wait for a few hours while we found the ideal place for the patient to be operated on. Now, what I had to do, the rule was you ring around all the hospitals, find a surgeon who was prepared to do the operation. You ring around, find an anaesthetist who was prepared to operate, find a free intensive care bed, and all three of those had to be in one hospital for the patient to be taken into that hospital. The hospital we found that could do this was somewhere in East London. I put the patient in an ambulance. As just before he got to that hospital in East London, a patient in that East London hospital had a stroke and used up the intensive care bed, and that patient now had to be moved. And ultimately, he ended up in Stoke Mandeville Hospital several miles away from Ealing Hospital yeah. and did not have his operation until 24 hours plus afterwards. And remember, ambulances are dangerous places for ill patients to be shunted from one place yes, to the next. Absolutely. So putting a patient in an ambulance in that sort of emergency scenario is not ideal. The jury really did not understand what was being required of them. And they said so. They came back, they deliberated, for several hours, a day or two, came back to the judge, handed him a piece of paper, and said, my lord, we really don't understand the complexities of this case. Sadly, the judge did not give them any further guidance. Just told them to get on with it. And he told them to get on with it, they, and they did get on with it. They went back, they deliberated, came back, and despite the fact that they you know, said they didn't really understand what they were deliberating on, they found me guilty. Remember, uh, in our justice system, you are only found guilty of a crime if you've been tried fairly by a jury that understands what they are deliberating on. Mm. So one element, two elements of this case didn't match up. A, I hadn't been tried fairly. The jury didn't understand what they were deliberating on, and yet I was found guilty of the patient's manslaughter. I was cleared of the cleared of the perjury charge. I, I was cleared of the perjury charge. And the jury was not unanimous, it was 10 to 2. It was 10 to 2, that's right, um, yeah. At this point, immediately you put in handcuffs. Yeah. You are put in a prison van. Well, just before I was put in the prison van, it was a really a very emotional situation. First of all, um, I was said not to have shown any emotion by the papers that reported on this. The next day, this case, remember, a surgeon being tried for killing his patient had generated huge media interest. I mean, the, the case was on the evening news every, every, every evening while the trial was going on. So uh, 
you know, it and, and it's relentless. I mean, just the practicalities of you having to wake up in your home and travel in to old, the old Bailey every they day. They were following us with their cameras yeah. every day. But anyway, after I, I was convicted of the manslaughter, I, was, I got up, I was handcuffed to uh, one of the prison warders, and as I looked up as I was being carried out down into the um, basement of the old Bailey, I looked up and I saw my family, they were all crying. In, in the, uh, that was really a very haunting uh, spectacle. It really, it really uh, was very difficult. And then I was put in a prison van. Prison vans are merely uh, prisons on wheels. They really are inhumane, inhuman ways to carry uh, in people. I said in my book that if horses were transported in the same way as humans, the RSPCA would probably take their cause because it really is a very, very traumatic ride. At the time of your conviction, how old were you? I, well, if you look at my, my date of birth, I think, I don't know how old I was. I just, but, but officially, I, I think I was about six, 66, 66 at the time, yeah. You know, and there was, there was a lot of thought in medicine at the time uh, that given your record, given the, the stellar career that you'd had, given your age at the time, so 66, that the GMC could have, that could, the one option, they could have just let you have retired. Well, why do you punish crime? You punish crime for a number of reasons. One, you do it as a deterrent. So if somebody is you know, breaking into houses and so on, hopefully by punishing them, you deter them. Number two, you incapacitate them. So for the time that they are out in prison, they're not going to be committing that crime. Number three, you provide what you call justice as a means of closure to the family. The family can take some comfort in the fact that the person who did it has now been found, been incapacitated, been deterred, etc. And finally, you give what you think is a thing called justice. Basically, what it is really is it's a primal human behavior. It's really revenge. Remember, there was a time when we used to hang people for forms of illegal, unlawful killing. The last killing in England was in 1964. And the last two people we hanged, one was a woman. So we are a country that believes in an eye for an eye. We believe in retribution. We believe in revenge. That's barbaric. Uh, the law that allowed uh, hanging was still on the statute books until 1975, so in recent memory. So in this country, we believed in you know, uh, retribution as a means of uh, punishing crime. Now, what did all that achieve in my case? You ask the question, the GMC could have simply retired me, but no. Society had to have uh, their own bit of retribution, but did it really solve anything? I, okay, all they had to do was to suspend my registration, but my registration bit was suspended. My career by that time had now been completely damaged, so there was just no way that I was gonna come back. You know, and, uh, the family, okay, they knew they'd got somebody who, um, you know, had killed their whatever, their, their, their loved one, uh, but what was that really going to serve? What it did serve was really something much more sinister because it sent out shockwaves to the whole of the medical profession. No doubt this is something that we're going to be coming to talk about. Because we did a survey when we were doing my uh, appeal that showed that the majority of doctors interviewed who had heard of my case were so afraid that they were now practicing defensive medicine. Again, uh, we can talk about this a little bit later or I can go on to explain a little bit about what defensive medicine is really all about. Well, let's talk about it now. Um, I, I would imagine that even in those three years that you were still practicing um, in the intervening period before the course, that if you were, that you were more defensive in your own? I was very defensive. What defensive medicine is, is medicine that is done so that if there is any comeback, the doctor would be covered. Let me give you an example. You see somebody with abdominal pain, 
you put your hand on the tummy, there's a little bit of uh, tenderness, a bit of soreness, and slight temperature. It may be nothing, you know, uh, it may be a viral gastroenteritis or whatever. But what you do is you consistently put all of them on antibiotics for the fact that occasionally for there may be somebody with a bacterial infection and if anything happened to that individual with the bacterial infection you could always go back and justify having put them on antibiotics and nobody's really going to question you. And on that's that. a relatively low risk, low morbidity thing that people would be quite inclined to do I imagine. Well, uh, antibiotics, there is a problem with antibiotics. Some people do get antibiotic related colitis which can kill them and in the end, one of the things that we're doing with antibiotics and using them in that sort of willy-nilly fashion is that we are reducing their efficacy in the longer term. One day, antibiotics are no longer going to be part of our armamentarium for medical treatment. That's defensive medicine. And the, one, of the other, one of the other examples I give of defensive medicine is I use the example of somebody with headaches. A thousand people with headaches, one of them will probably have a brain tumor. But the defensive practitioner is going to send all of them to have a brain scan because he doesn't want to miss, uh, or they don't want to miss that one case. In fact, a good history, a good physical examination might have whittled down the numbers. But uh, in, in a defensive practice, you send all of them to have a brain scan. And what that does is several things. One, it clogs up your brain scanning system so that people who really need it don't, can't get to it. The second is it makes the patient very anxious because the patient who probably didn't really need that brain scan now thinks, oh, I think the doctor says I've got a brain tumor. 999 of them will have nothing wrong with them. But what's even worse is that you'll probably pick up something on one of those, on several of those brain scans completely benign, which you'd never have known about, and you might even operate on somebody uh, with those abnormalities because you don't really know the nature of it, and they'd never have, have actually, it would never have come to their attention. So by de practicing defensive medicine, you're really doing great harm to your yeah. patients purely to cover your own backs. Uh, and in addition to that, you're adding huge costs to the provision of health Defensive medicine is a very expensive um, form, form of practice. Going back to your analogy of the antibiotics, that's at the, the lower morbidity end of the spectrum. I imagine the other end of the spectrum, there are people getting laparotomies who would not need them. Yes, yes. A lot of the appendicectomies that are done uh, are done for purely that reason. We know that there are lots of negative appendicectomies, i.e. you take out the appendix, you send it to the lab, and they say, oh, there was nothing wrong with the appendix. But you can justify that. People accept that as opposed to if you didn't, if you didn't do that, one out of a hundred of those would probably turn out to have appendicitis in the end. And you're worried about the consequences of that in that one individual who might, you might have been able to pick up anyway a bit later on in their course. But in order to deflect any sort of blame on your own part, you do that operation and of course you are now exposing them to the complications of an unnecessary appendicectomy. They'll get their adhesions a bit later on, they get their wound infections, uh, they might get a whole number of issues that they may never have had. So defensive medicine is not without cost. You, you know, uh, one thing that I was thinking was that based on your case, do you think subsequently there are surgeons who may have done laparotomies, Hartmann's and colostomies in patients who may not have needed it? Yes, I think if you look at the literature, it's certainly much more studied in the US than it is in England, but I think there's every reason to believe that the practice in America is actually practice is, is being done here, where there is a huge body of lawyers, malpractice lawyers now, on the backs of uh, doctors, maybe far more than in England, but I think we're slowly going that way. And the literature is very clear. There are two forms of uh, defensive medicine. There is the positive, where you do things uh, in order to uh, protect your, your own self. But there is the avoidance behavior, where you don't touch very ill patients because your margin for error is now very small. And those ill patients are now being denied possibly life-saving surgery. Or you refer people unnecessarily. So a GP who sees somebody with 
a bit of abdominal pain, who he might have said, oh, come back tomorrow, I'll examine you again just to see whether your pain's got better or worse, uh, will now send all of them to hospital. So you're now clogging up secondary care from primary care because of that, and all of that is obviously to the detriment of patients. So defensive medicine really has uh, a lot of negative uh, aspects to yeah, it. Yeah, significant implications. Yeah. Um, if I may take you back, uh, um, I don't want to, but much of your book is um, centered on your time in prison. A lot of it is. Uh, and prison, um, I can't even imagine what that would, what would be like, but you put, you've, you've explained a, a very realistic picture. And prison life comes across as brutal, as physical, one of fear, humiliation, and solitude. Yes, I think it's really sad that in our so-called civilized society, we are still doing retribution as opposed to other forms of delivering justice. We believe, I mean, I, I, so prison was meant to deter me, was meant to uh, punish me, was meant to rehabilitate me. So the, the theory was when I came out, I was going to be a better doctor. Uh, it did none of those Doesn't things. achieve any of those. It didn't achieve any of that at all. What it did was it brutalized me. It, uh, it dehumanized me. I mean, putting me in this sort of situation where I was locked away for sometimes up to 22 hours a day in the midst of real uh, criminals. You know, I was in Belmarsh, which, as you know, is a Category A prison that held the terrorists, the rapists, the, the, the gangland people, etc. And all that that potentially exposed me to was really learning more about crime. People who go into prison, who are so inclined, are probably going to be worse criminals when they come out than when they go in. It really is a university of crime. Yeah. And this was the kind of atmosphere that I was exposed to. I was, it was a very, very tough uh, business being in there. And the thing is that you're a 66-year-old man. You could, uh, I was reading about how you'd get in the top bunk and even to get on the ladder, you'd have a chair to yeah. climb up. And there's so much that was wrong about it. Everything was wrong about it. The cell itself was, you'd said five steps. Five steps, steps by, by three. three. How would that compare, just to give you an that idea here of the is space we have here? This sort of space from here right. to the back where you are. And it had a toilet in the middle. So you all did your business. Um, open, exposed. Almost open. I mean, if you imagine that where that partition is over yeah. there and uh, somebody would be sitting there, you'd see the top half of them. You didn't see the bottom half of them, but you knew they were sitting yeah. there. You ate, your, you, you went away, got your meals, brought them back into this room. Uh, you did all your, you watched television, you wrote your letters in there. You, li you lived in there essentially for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it really is a dehumanizing situation to be in. And you weren't even allowed books at the time? No, we were not allowed books. It was only after I left prison that books were allowed because somebody actually took them to court uh, on human rights basis. Um, the problem with books was they said, oh, uh, the reason we don't allow books is because people hide contraband inside books, you know, mobile phones and guns and so on. Of course, the answer to that is the prison surveillance security system is probably more sophisticated than anything you have in airports. So if they really want to find, uh, you know, contraband in books, they have the means of doing so. And one of the suggestions we made was, well, don't let family send in books. My daughter actually suggested that she could simply write to Amazon or Waterstones and say, could you send dad a book entitled such and such and such, I'll pay for it and have it delivered to prison. Oh, no, we can't do that, we, uh, and so on. And one of the consequences I saw of that when I was in prison was of a prisoner who was standing behind me in the queue one day when we were queuing up for lunch and I had my menu in front of me you had to tick off what you wanted for the following week. And he came up to me and he said, oh, what does that say? What number one, number what at the, at the top? And I turned around to him and I said, oh, well, can't you read? He said, no, actually, I can't read. 
Um, he'd been in prison for 23 years and had still, was still not able to read or write. It's a huge indictment of our prison system that somebody could be in prison for 23 years and not taught how to read or write. So, uh, you know, allowing, disallowing books into prison was really one of the consequences of that ed lack of education, lack of rehabilitation in, in the prison system. But anyway, somebody took them to court and they lost. And ultimately, they did allow books into prison, but it really was a difficult time not being allowed to read books. You know, in Especially when you're locked up for 22 hours exactly. a day. Exactly, yeah. They, they had a prison library, but what was there was really pretty rubbishy, rubbishy books. You were, subsequent to that, you were transferred to an open prison. Yes. And, that was, uh, and you took on a role helping people, teaching other in inmates yes. how to read and write. I was teaching several things. One of them was IT. I'd done a fair amount of IT in my younger days, uh, you know, in the days of the Amstrad and you know, all that sort of thing. I was the Amstrad CPC 464. Yeah, that's right. I was actually one of my, I did my Master of Surgery uh, work on the application of uh, computers in uh, surgical practice. So I knew quite a bit about... You were ahead of your time. It's well, now I, I was actually, but I kind of let that lapse because I got more into surgery than into... Uh, into IT, but that's one of the things I taught. And also, um, I was teaching inmates of mine how to read and write, and that really w went down very well. I, mean, I was very proud that there was somebody I taught who could read and write, you know, by the time we left prison, which was really, yeah. It was, um, it was very hard reading. Knowing you and knowing of you, reading about the time in prison was very hard to read as well, I, I, was, I was cleaning toilets, I was cleaning the wing that I was in and so on. But, you know, I had to do something to stay sane and uh, to mark my time. As you progressed into the open prison, you were allowed to go on day visits. And, yeah. and eventually, after some time, you got to spend a night at home. Yes. What yes. Was, that, was it like that first night at home? That was incredible. Uh, we'd prepared for this for a long time. You, there was a number of things you had to do before you were allowed out into the community. First of all, uh, you had to convince the prison authorities that you were now ready. It's not an automatic right. In other words, just because you'd been there a certain, you'd had to, to have been there a certain amount of time before you were then allowed to test whether you were to be g given that privilege. Yes. And I was in front of a very tough committee and they were really asking some very silly questions. Um, and I you know, kept, Oh no, you don't protest your innocence in front of us. Uh, we're not here to listen to any of that at all. We just want to hear whether you're going to be safe to be out there and you're not going to be a danger. And people were actually denied going out. So I had to go through a very tough committee to be allowed uh, out. And initially it was out in the uh, local and local uh, sites. You weren't allowed to your own home immediately. You went on day visits, so you had to do a few of those successfully. And while you're out there, you're, you're not allowed certain things. You're not allowed. You're not allowed into a pub. You're not allowed to go into a shop that sold alcohol, etc. And you know, we did that a number of times before ultimately I was allowed to actually go to my own house. And that was a very strange feeling. I'd not been there for several months. And I didn't really know how the, um, you know, my neighbours would, you know, uh, yeah. view me and react and so on. And um, I remember the morning after I came home, I came out to start my car. You know, it, it had been standing there and the battery had completely gone. So I had to get a charge for my wife's car and so on. And the neighbours saw me, they came out to me and, you know, they were saying, oh, we do understand what, well, we don't understand what you've gone through, but we can imagine the, the, you know, how it must have felt. You've got all our support and so on. So any kind of anxieties I had about how they felt about me was all dispelled. But it was a very difficult time. Now that was nice to hear. The, the, the one thing that um, struck me was that we as doctors, we have treated people who've done violent crime towards other people, who have possibly even killed someone and we've treated them as patients yep. and yet we treat the patients with a relatively neutral mind and treat the pathology 
However, when we hit well, with respect, not just with a neutral mind, I think we really we, yeah. we treat them all as humans. Yes, as a, in my book, I describe how I had a swollen left leg when I was in prison. And it took a long time for me to actually convince uh, one of the prison officers that a swollen leg was serious. In somebody who'd been confined in a prison cell for 22 hours a day and so on, one of the biggest dangers, of course, was having a, a DVT, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And it took over a week for me to convince them that you know this needed investigation. Ultimately, when they granted me uh, the facility to go out and be investigated to an A and E department, I was carried out in handcuffs. I was handcuffed between two prison borders, one lady and one gentleman You're on either side. I was shackled on both sides. And when I got to West Suffolk Hospital, I hate to mention hospitals, but that's sadly where I, where I went. And um, a, the doctors and the nurses there treated me not as a patient, but as a prisoner. Uh, the the kind of the, the 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 interaction between them and me was really not not as a human being, but just as somebody lowly there. The prison warders stood by while the history was being taken, while I was being examined. I had to have a groin ultrasound, for example, uh, looking at the venous system in my left leg, and they wouldn't they wouldn't stand out. They stood over me while this was all being done. And yet in my book, I described that actually when I was a registrar, I worked at Hammersmith Hospital. And also when I came back from Oman, I worked there as, as a consultant surgeon at Hammersmith Hospital. The prisoners from Wormwood Scrubs, right next door. Hammers, Hammersmith Hospital was their local hospital. Yeah, it's physically. And yeah. I treated them all with the sort of respect that I thought I'd be afforded. Um, but sadly, when it came to me, I wasn't afforded any of that. And also, it wasn't even just in the prison environment. I mean, I was a member of the BMA. I'd, I joined the BMA as a student, so I'd supported the BMA right from the word go. When I was at home, on a home, my first home visit, one of the things I wanted was legal advice from the BMA, because well, that's one of the things they offer. As is your right. As is my right. It's something I paid for. And when I rang the BMA, uh, one of the people who answered the phone said, oh, hang on, you're telling me that you have a criminal record. Well, I said, I've explained what my situation is. Oh, well, if you've got a criminal record, we're not going to have people with criminal records on our books. Hang on the phone, I'll put you to our subscriptions department and get them to take you off our books, which I found really very insulting. Anyway, we did eventually talk to the uh, president of the BMA on that, and he was absolutely mortified to know that I'd been treated in that way. Uh, it was completely unnecessary for somebody to treat me in that way. So, but there it was. Uh, and there's it was very judgmental. The, 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 there's the, the loss of dignity, the loss of privacy, but also um, the loss of self, because you're referred to many times by uh, the appeal by, uh, as a as criminal, as a prisoner, as a convict, and it it just doesn't sit well. It's, it's, it's dehumanizing. I keep using that word because that's really what it is. You know, you're no longer... In fact, when I was in prison, people said to me, don't uh, make it known that you're a doctor because you get treated worse as a doctor because they all accuse you of going to the Harold Shipman School of Surgery and, um, you know, i.e. professional killers. And I really tried my very best not to let on that I was a doctor. The day you released, yeah. um, not, not the actual um, technicality, the logistics of it, but when you're home, the feeling, is it one of joy? Is it one of relief? Um, it's not really joy. I think it's in a way disappointment and anger in a sense, because you're being denied uh, I mean, I knew along, all along that I hadn't committed a crime and I was being treated in our so-called criminal justice system as a criminal. And I think that to me was far more difficult, really, than uh, the incarceration itself, of course, was, you know, I'd, was really difficult. But the emotions were 
really a tinge of anger, of disappointment in our legal system. And, uh, and I imagine this sense of injustice never went away. After you released, um, Jenny Vaughan, consultant neurologist, yeah. played a huge and very vocal role, along with Ian Franklin and many others, yeah. and was central to lodging an appeal. Yes, Jenny is really somebody I owe a huge debt of gratitude to because Jenny is a stickler for, uh, she, is, she just doesn't like injustice in any shape or form. And she had actually started forming a group that started the appeal well before, you know, even at the time that I was in prison. And she mounted, she got together a group of people, even got money uh, donated into the uh, appeal fund that we used to mount the appeal. And, you know, she did really amazing work. Was there ever a part, at this point, you had served your sentence? Was there ever a part of you that said, I don't want to get up and put on a suit and tie and go into the court again every day or go into the tribunal every day? Was there part of you thought, I can't be bothered with an appeal? Yes, I think it, it was not easy having to relive all of that over and over again, again because yeah. this was really what we were going through every single time. But I think we had to fight because, uh, as I say, I didn't think I'd committed a crime. The way that I was tried was completely unjust. And I think we had to show up our so-called criminal justice system for what they were. And for that reason alone, I think I was, I was in the end, even though there was a lot of reluctance from even family and friends, do you really want to go through all of this all over again? And there were times when I felt, what's it all going to be for? And what if we lose? We'd have gone through all of that and had the trauma of going through it. But you know, we had to give it a chance. And in fact, I think it's, it's fair to point out that we knew the statistics were hugely, hugely tipped against us. You know, this was the first time that an out of time appeal had actually been allowed. You, know, you have 28 days yes. in which to lodge an appeal in law after you've been convicted. And of course that time had passed. It, this was many years after the, uh, the original conviction. One, one of the interesting things that came out in your appeal was the hospital's own root cause analysis yeah. that you mentioned earlier. That was obtained as part of the subject access request. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it showed all the systemic failings that you mentioned and alluded to earlier. Yeah. But the first time, the coroner, ne coroner never saw that. The GMC yeah. never saw it. Yeah, yeah. The Crown Court never saw it. Yeah, that's right. And that's right. that could have cleared you the first time. It might have made a difference. That root cause analysis was not allowed in the appeal because a it was there all along we just didn't know about it and therefore when you're doing an appeal they never allow you to adduce any evidence that you could have brought in at your trial so anything anything that you bring in should be new evidence not something that you should have had in your original trial and also uh, it might offer some mitigation but it's never actually used as a means of overturning a conviction. It would have made a difference at the original trial. And remember one of the, um, when the law of gross negligence manslaughter was instituted into medicine in the case of Adamaco, the Lords in the House of Lords were very clear to say that when you judge a doctor or a healthcare worker, you must judge them in the context in which they were working. In other words... But that didn't happen. It didn't happen in my case. Mm. Medicine is not practiced in a vacuum. Medicine is too complex. There will be other practitioners. There will be nurses. There will be doctors. There will be x-ray departments. Uh, there will be labs. And more importantly, there would be all the systems that you are entitled to, the theatres, the anesthetists, the, the various facilities that you require, the processes that allow you to practice your profession. And all of those should be taken into account when you're judging the actions of a doctor. It's not just what Bailey and Love says, when you're you know, doing this, you've got to do A, B, C, D, E, 
but it never actually takes the systems into account. The exact same issues are stark in the case of Hadiza Bawagaba. Exactly, yes. Uh, Hadiza's case was one very classic example of how systemic factors, and again the Swiss cheese model that you, uh, you know, a doctor that comes from maternity leave, she's covering for two more, two other doctors, the IT system is broken down, her supervisor decides to go and give a lecture somewhere else, and you know, takes down the blood gas as being grossly abnormal and patient grossly acidotic, writes it down, then goes away, and so on and so forth. The parent who gives a dose of uh, you know, a beta blocker to the child who was already hypertensive. So all the Swiss cheese you know, are things that lined up uh, and the systemic factors were never taken into account. And yet the, the one, one person carries the can. Exactly, that's right, yeah. Um, in, the, in, in terms of your conviction, on what basis was it overturned? It was overturned on a number of grounds. One, the fact that the judge hadn't adequately uh, instructed the jury. There are some very clear things that a judge should tell the jury in a case of uh, any crime, but particularly when it uh, goes negligence manslaughter. And it seemed the judge really didn't understand what his brief was. Uh, the other issue that the uh, Lord Justices uh, really were very critical of was expert testimony. Expert witnesses are not really expert or witnesses. They're not expert because you know all the experts so-called that gave testimony in my Old Bailey trial had never actually given evidence in, in a criminal uh, case. They're not really witnesses. They were not there when things that happened, happened. All they're doing is really giving an opinion, and anyone can give an opinion. So expert witness is something of a misnomer, really, but they were completely out of their depths in the way that they were giving ex expert testimony. Medicine is not black and white. You do this, something happens. It's, it's a spectrum. There are several ways of treating a particular condition. The role of the expert witness is to consider those several ways and know what the breadth of what's right is and understand when you fall out of the parameters that are set for that. It's not what they would do, nor even what is best practice, because if we are all judged of best practice, we don't give best practice every single day that we step into you know, to see our patients. Uh, if we were judged for not delivering best practice, you know, we would all be criminals. So there is... I'd wager that virtually every doctor in the country would fall short exactly, of that in some way. Exactly, yeah. So there is a yardstick by which you measure whether negligence has occurred. And it's what, a, if anything, that a group, a reasonable body of doctors would have done in the circumstances mm. is what you did, then you didn't commit, you didn't, you didn't commit an offence. And yet, the expert witnesses who adjudicated really didn't, know, didn't, un, didn't understand that law at all. And so uh, the judges were very uh, critical of the role of the expert witness and of the prosecutor because they were giving the verdicts that the jury should really have been left to the jury. And the other problem, of course, is that the jury don't really understand and the law doesn't actually state what gross negligence really is. There is no dividing line. It's, uh, it's left to a jury to decide whether what you've done was a criminal offence. So it must have been a huge relief when that conviction was overturned. Well, it was a huge relief. Was it a surprise? It, I was not. Well, I was surprised because the chances of us getting to that stage okay. were so low. Uh, everybody told me, oh, just you know, go in knowing that you're going to come out with nothing positive. Yeah. So yes, it was a relief. We were very pleased naturally. But one of the things I mentioned in the, in the book was that a law had been passed some 15, 20 years earlier that said that anybody who'd been wrongly convicted and served time in prison was no longer entitled to any form of comp compensation. Mm. Not that financial compensation would have really put right any of what I went through, but it would have helped because, you know, um, I'd lost my career, mm. I'd lost my salary, my children were you know, still in education or, you know, looking for jobs and so on. So yeah, it was a very difficult time for us financially. That was one thing I wanted to ask, uh, that I'd ask you. 
so you, you got no compensation. No, no apology, no compensation. The apology is the other thing. So, yeah. who, so who did someone pay for this gross injustice? I did. I did. My family did. My children did. You paid the, the highest price. We paid the price, and we paid the price for uh, injustice. We paid the price of all the wrongs in the private hospital because all the systemic errors that really contributed to this patient's uh, demise, in my view, were never aired and therefore never corrected. The family also were losers in this, and you know, uh, Lord Leveson, who was the, um, the chief judge in the appeal, said, you know, there have been no winners in this case. Even the law has been tarnished in this respect. Uh, the family did not really get any adequate closure of their case because, uh, the, you know, at the end of it all, they wanted the coroner to reopen the inquest. You know, after I'd been cleared in the criminal court, after I'd been cleared at the GMC, they suddenly looked back and said, well, you know, in the court, they said he was guilty. So who now? Who do we hold responsible for what happened to our loved one? And then they never got the answers. So in the end, everybody lost. And your GMC conviction was overturned. Were you allowed back on the register? Yes. The interesting about the GMC uh, case, several things really. The first was that the GMC was the very first body that actually tried my case in its entirety, right at the beginning, even before we got to the coroner's court. And they looked at it really in great detail and forensically, and they said no case to answer. And yet, in spite of that, they put me through a six-week trial in Manchester after we uh, won the, um, the, the appeal. And they went through the same charges all over again. And they tried that in very minute detail, and they cleared me. Of a higher criminal standard. Yeah. And the, that was a yeah, fascinating that's thing. That's a very good point. Now, in English law, you don't have to prove your innocence. It's the duty of your accuser to prove your guilt. And the bar for that proof is very low in a civil court like the GMC, but it's very high in a criminal court. So they've really got to have a higher standard of proof at the Old Bailey than at the GMC. Right. So the irony of my case was that the GMC tried me twice at a civil level and cleared me on both occasions, and yet I'd been convicted at a criminal level where the bar of proof was higher. So it shows gross injustice in our so-called um, criminal justice system. Several issues with the GMC, really. One is, I mean, I have a lot of admiration for regulation. It's important because when a patient sits in front of a doctor, it's reassuring for them to know that that doctor is qualified, is properly trained, is accredited, and skilled, and safe. And there are lots of things in the GMC armamentarium which, uh, well, when I say ensure, which, you know, see into that. There are a number of practices at the GMC which are still open to controversy. One of them is the way they handle complaints. When I first came into medicine many, many years ago, I was told that there were real issues of race at the GMC. And I was very disappointed that the GMC had actually done nothing about this until fairly recently when they appointed Leslie Hamilton to look into the whole business about referrals to the GMC. This was many, many years down the line. Uh, they finally acknowledged that the vast majority of people referred to the GMC are from ethnic minority backgrounds. Mm. The disappointment I had with the Hamilton inquiry was that it stopped short of actually discovering. So it, yes, it did uh, certainly uncover, or when I say uncover, it really just simply told us what we already knew that the vast majority of referrals are of ethnic minority doctors. But well, what we don't really know is when those referrals get to the GMC, there are complaints 
that the GMC handles the cases of ethnic people far differently from those of white doctors. That, for example, uh, there is a higher proportion of ethnic doctors convicted crime for you know, uh, misdemeanor for misdemeanor, and also they get strict, harsher punishment. The GMC denies that, incidentally, but we don't really know whether it actually is true because it's never been tested. Apart from laying standards for medical schools and so on, uh, one of the uh, objectives of what they're doing is really to rehabilitate. They don't really take any part in rehabilitation. Their sentinel mechanism for picking up who is at fault in hospitals is also very poor. I mean, that's how people like um, Harold Shipman, for example, got away with what he did for so long, because the reporting mechanism that they have in place, where you, you pick up people who are at fault. The, the mantra is, if, you, if you've not been reported, then you're fine. If you're reported, you're probably guilty. Well, we know that the vast majority of people who do things wrong in hospitals are actually people who never get reported, either because of bullying or because of the culture where you know, people gang around one another and protect others. So the whole fault reporting system is, is really wrong. And therefore, um, I think there's quite a lot that the GMC needs to do to really put its house in order. And as I say, they tried me twice and uh, suspended me for over six years for something for which they cleared me completely. So in the end, you know, my career has been completely destroyed for something I didn't do. You mean you lost everything? You I lost, lost, I lost your everything. Your job, your income, your... My reputation. Ra reputation, my, yeah. your raison d'etre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. Something you've dedicated your whole life to, you know, the times Absolutely. when your family has Absolutely. suffered Absolutely. because you put yeah. your work first. Yeah, yeah. And the thing to remember is that, yes, there are criminal doctors. Uh, there are those who do it for the sake of crime. But the vast, vast majority of doctors get out of bed in the morning wanting to do the best for their patients. And yet they could still be tried for a criminal offence, even though they have no intention of causing any harm. And this is really one of the difficulties of stomaching, you know, the whole criminalisation of uh, medical error. Are you the same man now who went into prison? Um, in some ways not. Uh, first of all, um, I think there is no doubt that going through the sort of stress that I went through does actually have an impact on one's physical health. I think there have been a lot of studies to show that there, are, there is genetic harm when you are constantly exposed to stress. It does have an impact on life expectancy, for example, yeah. is actually uh, negatively impacted upon by what you go through. But there are other harms psychologically uh, yes, I am more empathic probably than I was. I mean, I go into clinics now with a completely different outlook from what I did. Not that I was never empathic uh, when I was practicing. You know, that's, that was a whole issue of going into something like cancer surgery, for example. Yeah. But I think it's, it's a kind of, it's a different kind of empathy. It's more of cynical empathy really that uh, it doesn't really matter what good you do that you could still be held to account for things that you never did that it's an unfair and unjust society and I think your outlook and your attitude is all clouded by that fact um, I look at life in a slightly different way from the way I did, you know, uh, because I'd lost a lot of material, um, you know, a lot of the things I planned for, you know, the stage at which I was taken out was the stage when I was just beginning to prepare for my retirement, and yet, you know, a lot of the things that I wanted have now all gone. So, um, you know, what I could have done for my children, um, 
and also the sort of legacy that I'll leave, I think. Uh, what I don't want to be judged by is what we're talking about today, that I was responsible for a patient's death. But in a way, one of the good things about what we're doing today is that it does highlight uh, the injustice that exists in medicine. And if what we're talking about is in any way going to be making things a little bit better for people coming after us by highlighting the, these injustices, by discussing some of the ways in which things could be done better. I think, uh, in a way, you know, what I've gone through uh, would have had a, a, a good impact. And in terms of um, make, uh, making things better for the people coming after, mm. um, one question is the risk posed to patient safety by the adversarial system yeah. of inquiries into complications. Is the law the best way to treat medical error? Definitely not, definitely not. I think it's been shown in many jurisdictions uh, that criminalising medical error is not really a good thing. I mean, in New Zealand, for example, the law is completely different. Even in Scotland, uh, within the United Kingdom, there is a law of culpable homicide, but it's never actually been commuted. Nobody has actually been charged of it or certainly found guilty of it. The problem with criminalizing medical incidents is that we lose the ability to learn from what has happened. And one of the other issues is that we don't have that safe space that they have in aviation. You know, if you give a dose of, twice a dose of penicillin that was prescribed, or you prescribe penicillin and a nurse gives twice the dose that you prescribed, and the patient actually suffers no harm. That is still a major incident. Mm. The reason for that is that next time it happens, it may not be penicillin, it may be insulin. And therefore, there is real potential that harm could be caused. That is a major incident. Now, in aviation, what they do is they provide a safe space for people to come and report. Oh, by the way, I gave twice the dose of penicillin that I should have done disseminate that information to others in the establishment. It may be that there is something in the system that is preventing, that, uh, that is causing that to happen. And by learning from that incident, even though it's not caused harm, you will prevent further incidents from happening in the future. But we don't do that in medicine. And in this safe medicine. space, there would be no fear of punishment. Uh, there's no fear punishment. of punishment or reprisal or whatever. And therefore, people feel more confident to come forward to talk. In medicine, unfortunately, what we do is we look for somebody to blame rather than attempt to fix the systemic issues that really around whatever it is that's, that's uh, resulted in that incident. When we look at your case, we're now 10 years on from when it happened. Can we be sure that this won't happen again to another doctor today? Yeah, but I think the problem also to remember is biological systems are not as predictable as really people want them to be. Uh, you give drug A, patient gets better. Well, we know you, know you can give the same drug to two people and have completely different outcomes. And I think people need to, the public needs to recognize that medicine is not a perfect science. If you could um, go back and talk to David Sello in 2010, at the beginning of this journey, is, what would you advise him? Good question. I've been asked that many times. Would I ever go back into medicine if I knew what happened to me? I think the answer is yes, I would. Uh, it's a profession that I you know, hold dearly to my heart. We haven't talked about the case of my son, James. But I think, uh, I mean, his was a very sad case because James was aged 24 when my case happened. He'd qualified in medicine for Manchester with an intercalated master's in uh, medical research. Your alma mater. Yeah, and so he'd spent a quarter of his whole life studying medicine. He'd spent his whole adult life studying medicine and at the end of it all, he was coming from Manchester to the Old Bailey when I was being tried. He'd come and sit in the middle of a trial. 
and he'd go back to Manchester, finish reading, do, do an exam the next day and come back again two days later. And he did all this in the middle. So he was very traumatized mm. in the middle of it all. Anyway, uh, then I was tried, then I went to prison. And when I came out, James, well, it was actually one of the times I came home on home leave. And he took the opportunity to come home to talk to me and my wife. And he said, Mom, Dad, when we were growing up, you were never there for our nativity plays, our sports days. You know, I might have actually been a better sportsman if you were there to encourage me, etc. When, when we were ill, it was only mum that took us to hospitals and so on because you were in your Ealing hospital treating patients. You're ringing a chord with me as well here. Yeah, you. and now, you know, after one single incident in a 40-year career where you'd probably saved thousands of lives. One single incident, which wasn't even your fault. I think even he had worked out in the middle of all this that it really wasn't nothing to do with what I'd done wrong. And this is how medicine and the law treat you. If that's what I can expect, then medicine is not for me. And he'd just been given his first F1, FY1 job and he just packed it all in. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He's, he's now in business. He, so, gave, he gave up medicine. Which is a real loss to pe all the patients. So, you know, he might have been a very good doctor, and I think he probably would have been a good doctor, but that's sadly one of the consequences of what I went through, and I think that's a very sad message really to people out there. But so the question, would I, would I do what I... Yes, I think I would. I, I'd, you know, it's a very... Uh, noble profession, and I, I would really go through what I went through. I'd be obviously a lot more cautious yeah. now compared to, yeah. you know, not, not that I wasn't cautious at the time. I think it was all just a number of incidents that lined together in that Swiss cheese model that you very aptly described, but that's, that's how it was. Has anything positive come out of this ordeal? I hope so. I hope so. Um, I think it's brought to the fore a number of things that are really wrong in the way that we handle uh, medical error. I'm giving a talk at the RSM on the 17th. It's the end of a series of talks that they've been giving into when things go wrong. And we've had a lot of uh, speakers from the uh, medical defence unions, we've had people talk from New Zealand, really looking at the various ways in which we handle the whole issue of how we go about dealing with some of the incidents that happen in medicine. And I think one of the things that they're going to be using is my own case to really try and highlight what is wrong with the present system and how we can use it to make things better. So if my, if my case has been a catalyst in bringing all this out to the fore, then it would have been a good thing. Was there anything positive for you personally that came out of this? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think, well, I think I'm, I'm probably a better person as a consequence, but I hope I'm not a bitter person. You don't come across um, as that, although I wouldn't blame you if I you think were. I there was a lot of bitterness at the beginning, but what I was warned about is that it will destroy you if you carry on being bitter, and therefore it's not really the way to go forward, and I think I've, I've, learned, I've learned that. Also, I guess it was, would have been nice to have seen all the support you had within the medical community and all your friends and colleagues come to the fore. Yeah, I think I had a lot of support. There were even people coming to my aid that I didn't know about. I mean, one of them was a chap called um, Ian Franklin, who was a vascular surgeon I operated with once in Ealing Hospital. He was at Charing Cross, and I was doing a cancer case one day, and somebody's tumor was stuck on the iliac vessels, and I just didn't know what to do. So I called him, and he came over, and we operated for about three or four hours, and then that was the last time I heard of him. And uh, the next thing I know, I had a letter from him when I was in prison, and he'd set up a website to support my case, to raise my money for my appeal. And so um, 
you know, there was a lot of camaraderie at the end of it all, and there were lots of people who came to my aid that I didn't even, hadn't even known, or had only met very fleetingly, you know, in the course of life. So, uh, yeah, I think there were, there were lots of positives in that respect. But that's it, and I, and I recall, as you're, when I was your SHA, you being a real family man. Um, I, I remember you, uh, firstly, your wife was slightly a formidable matron, but when she <laughs> found out we were the general surgical SHAs, we were looked after. So I'm very yes, grateful to yes. her. And I remember you telling us how um, you took great delight your children would come to you if they needed a button sewing on <laughs> to their clothes. Yes, I had my, <laughs> my surgical skills where yeah. I still put to good use at home. Yes, yes, so, indeed. So it's no, fantastic. They'd, they'd been very, they've been very supporting, extremely yeah. supporting. And, and, yeah. and the thing that's clear yeah. reading the book was that this punishment was not just of you, it was equally of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think it's it's been a very difficult time for all of us. but. You know, it's, it brought us together and we move on. The thing that's, that's, that's impressed me has been the, the grace and the manner which you've dealt with it and the way you've tried to do your utmost to prevent these things from happening again by highlighting the lessons learned from your case. Yeah, I think I've been around talking at various fora and I was even at the College of Surgeons. One of the things that we were trying to get the college to do well, with several things really. When I was going through, all I was going through, I rang the college to try to get pastoral, psychological and other help. And I really didn't get that. We also complained to them about uh, expert witnesses and how they were not trained, not regulated and so on. And they've made several changes. They've now got a body that offers help to surgeons in, in difficulties not financial, but, you know, to give advice, to give psychological and other aid. But also uh, they've uh, issued a booklet, which I was in Newcastle for the launching of, of uh, expert witnesses and really how they should behave and, you know, what the standard they should aspire to, etc. something that didn't really exist. Because I think prior to that, anybody could raise their hands and say, you know, I'm an expert witness, having not done it before, mm. and really go in with no knowledge as to how to give expert testimony in any case. And I think the college have now taken that on board. And one of the other things that they're doing is looking into the whole business about the support of ethnic people within the, within the college and in college a hierarchy. Again, if you look at what's happening in the college, I think the college is really all run by white middle class males. And yes, we've had one female uh, co college president, we've had one black college president, but that's in uh, many thousand years of his, 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 history. Yeah. Uh, so they've still got quite a lot of work to do. And I think they've now recognized that, you know, they really need to put a lot of this right. And I think this is partly come, come across because of my case. Well, uh, given that we're an author hub, it's not often we can take credit, but we're about to have uh, Deborah Eastwood as our second ever female president of the BOA. Okay. So okay. I'd like to think orthopedics is leading the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. And on that note, listen, I'd like, thank you very much for taking the time to come today. It's been a great, great pleasure. I think it's and been lovely uh, to see you again. I'm, we're very nice grateful for your service over the four decades. Okay. And uh, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys.